Welcome to Viking Radio Theater. My name is Walter Lech, and I'm the production director as well as your host for this episode. If this is your first time tuning in, Viking Radio Theater is a monthly, hour-long program written, acted, and recorded by the writers, actors, and sound engineers of Western Washington University and our local community. We revitalize the genre of radio theater, utilizing the format to tell modern stories with a style that engages the imagination. But this episode will feature something a little different. On March 4th, we hosted the second 1940s Mystery Dinner Night at the Leopold Crystal Ballroom. The whole night of casino gaming, dancing, dinner, and mystery was set completely in the 1940s. During dinner, Viking Radio Theater took to the stage to perform a live version of our show with original pieces written in the style of period audio drama. It's those stories we'll air for you this episode. So if you weren't able to make it to the 1940s Mystery Dinner Night, here's your chance to enjoy at least a portion of it. Without further ado, enjoy this broadcast from the fictional 40s radio station, VRTE Bellingham. Good evening once again to our live audience and all of you listening at home. This is the Viking Radio Theater Hour, bringing you thrilling adventure, romance, and suspense every night at 7.30. Later in this hour, you'll hear the latest adventure of the spectacular Sergeant USA. But first, we'll take you back to the origins of this amazing patriot and his very first adventure. Here to save the day, it's Sergeant USA. Kids, grab yourself some of Aunt Butterbee's frosted spam pops and sit yourself down for the new thrilling adventures of Sergeant USA and his spectacular battles with our nation's greatest enemies. But our hero is not ready to face the evils of the world just yet. For now, he is just the mild-mannered Ulysses Scott Anderson. In tonight's fantastic adventure, brought to you by Aunt Butterbee's frosted spam pops, he will transform into the terrific hero you will come to know as the one and only Sergeant USA. <laughs> We find our young hero walking the streets of Detroit, somewhat distraught. Hey, watch it, kid! Oh, hey, you watch it! And I'm not a kid, I'm 19! Yeah, sure. 19 pounds! Uh, come here, you! <laughs> yeah, run away! No parents, no job, no place to stay. My life is one big sob story. And now kids on the street are busting my chops for being too skinny. Hey, kid, did you say you needed a job? Huh? Who are you? And don't call me kid. What's your name, then? My name? It's Ulysses. Ulysses? You just call me Scott. That's my middle name. Well, here's my card, Scott. If you are perhaps interested in recovering some items for me. Sure, I'll do anything. Good, good. What is your full name, young man? Ulysses Scott Anderson, USA. My parents were very patriotic. Patriots, eh? And what about you, Scott? Are you a patriot? You bet your boots I am. Then perhaps not. Oh, wait, don't go. You, you didn't give me your card. You said that you had a job for me. I need a job. I did, but if you truly love this country of yours, then this is no job for you. What is that supposed to mean? You ain't a patriot? Oh, I am a patriot, just not for this country. What's your name? My name is Heinrich. Heinrich von Heinrichstein. Von Heinrichstein? You don't mean to tell me that you're a... A Nazi? Oh, Mr. Anderson, I have never heard such accusations. You're a Nazi! You're trying to get me to work for the Nazis! And what if I am? I'll tell you what. You'll fight me. You're hardly five feet tall, hundred pounds at most. You're nothing more than a little poodle. Your puny body will snap like a toothpick. I still need to try. It's the American thing to do. You silly Americans. I'll show you an American. Good day, Mr. Anderson. The German walks off with a sinister grin. Meanwhile, our young hero, Scott Anderson, lies defeated on the ground, bruised and beaten, when suddenly he sees a small dot in the sky, growing closer, its valiant figure becoming more and more distinct. What? What's that? A bald eagle? <coughs> what are you doing in the city? 
I've seen you guys out around Monroe, but never here in Detroit. Oh, wow. I've never seen one so close before. I could almost touch you. Gee, you're so bright and, and glowy. <coughs> your wings. Oh, you're, you're injured. That must be why you fell. Here, let me... <coughs> ah! Ow! Ow! You're scratching me! Ah! I was just trying... Ah! Stop it! Burn! Stop! Let go! Stop! Ah! <coughs> Our hero hits his head on a fire hydrant as he scrambles to get the mighty bird off of him. He passes out, cold and alone, on the side of the road, as the bald eagle scampers off to find better food to eat. Sometime later, perhaps a few minutes, perhaps a few hours, he awakes and finds, to his surprise, his head seated in the lap of a gorgeous young woman, who dabs gently at the blood on his face with a handkerchief. Wha what uh, Who are you? My name's Evelyn. I pulled you across the street and under this awning so we could get you dried up. It started to rain. Oh, you poor thing. You were just lying there, wet and cold, your face and hands covered in blood. I thought you might be dead. But when I saw you breathing, I thought I'd get you to some place a little safer. Couldn't get you far, though. You were too heavy. Too heavy? I'd never heard that one before. I knew fifth graders that weighed more than me. Even a tiny dame like you could lift me right over her head. I don't know any woman who can lift 200 pounds. 200 pounds? Yeah, you're what, six feet tall? I'm not. <gasps> Egad! What is it? I'm... I'm... I'm huge! Well, you don't have to tell me that. I dragged you a good 15 yards. No, you don't understand. I'm a wimp! I'm just a little punk. I'm just little Scott Anderson. This isn't my body. Well, your voice is coming out of your mouth, so I'd say that it's you, Scott. But uh, I've never been able to lift more than 50 pounds in my life. Feel my arm. Uh, sir, I don't think... Pinch me! Anything! Oh, all right. Ha <laughs> ha! That barely hurt. This is incredible. This morning I would have bruised. The bald eagle. It was glowing. Maybe when it scratched me it had some sort of effect on me. Huh. A radioactive bald eagle. <laughs> oh man, that Nazi's gonna get what's coming to him now. Glowing bald eagles? Nazis? Gee, mister, you're nuts! No. You see, that's how I ended up unconscious. I was talking to a guy in the street and I found out he was a Nazi, so I tried to fight him. He kicked my rear in a hot second. I knew he would, too. Then, after a little while, this injured bald eagle fell from the sky. Its wing was hurt. It must have been lost or confused. So I tried to help it and it started clawing at me, and then I just passed out. And this bald eagle that supposedly attacked you, it was glowing? Yep. Maybe it got too close to the power plant over in Newport. And you fought a Nazi in the street even though you knew you would lose. He's the enemy! We all have to do our part, right? I just wish I could do more. Maybe now I can. Now, a bald eagle in Detroit, I might buy that. But a Nazi agent? Here? How? Heck if I know, but it sounds like he's got an operation going. Something real big. I've got to go stop them. Well, you can't do that. And why not? You're still injured. Your face is covered in blood. It is? Sorry to ask, but can I borrow that handkerchief? I can do you one better. I've got a first aid kit right here. What, you carry around a first aid kit with you? I'm in nursing school right now. Never can be too safe these days. Now, hold on, this might sting a bit. Hmm, that's funny. What is it? It's so strange. I've cleaned off the blood, but you don't have any cuts on your face, not even a bruise. Don't you see what this means? I've healed! Well, that's impossible. If you were really just attacked a short while ago, like you say... I was! What's your name again? Evelyn? Evelyn, a miracle has just happened, and I'm going to use it. I'm going to fight back. Fight back? What, against this apparent Nazi that nearly beat you to death? Yes, and any other Nazis in Detroit. Hold on, Scott. You'll get yourselves killed doing something like that. But don't you see, Evelyn? I'm invincible! Invincible? You've gone cockeyed. Well, if I can't stop you, I'm coming with you. <laughs> what? You can't do that. And why not? You're a lady. Ladies shouldn't be getting in fights. If I can drag an enormous man like you to safety, I can fight. You'd be putting yourself in danger. And so would you. Yeah, but I can handle it. Well, how do you know that? You just said not a moment ago that you've never lifted more than 50 pounds. 
How do you know that Nazi won't just kill you? If you can even find him, that is. I'll find that Heinrich von Heinrichstein and get him locked up if it's the last thing that I do. You can bet on it. Heinrich von Heinrichstein? Are you sure you didn't just hallucinate all this? I'm certain of it. Thank you for your help, Evelyn. I'll be sure to return your handkerchief. You can keep it. And besides, why are you acting like you're about to say goodbye? I'm coming with you. But Evelyn... But nothing. <sighs> Fine. But stay behind me, all right? I don't want you getting hurt or anything, okay? If you insist. Do you even know where you're going? Just crossing the street, back to where you found me. Maybe there'll be some clue there. See anything? No. Wait. I think I found something. What is it? It's Heinrich's business card. He must have dropped it when we were fighting. Gee, it says right here, Heinrich von Heinrichstein. My goodness, you were telling the truth. I told you so. Look, it has an address here. Let's see, 19th Street? That's not too far from here. Let's try and sneak in. Come on, this way. So, what were you doing on this side of town anyway? It's only us orphans and poor folks over here on Skid Row. Pretty lady like yourself ought to be way uptown. I volunteer at the mission a few blocks east of here. The homeless shelter? Mm-hmm. Every weekend I come down here and do what I can to help. Doesn't hurt that I get to practice at nursing, too. Do you practice nursing in those heels, too? I know they don't look it, but these airstep heels come in handy. I got them at Saks Fifth Avenue for only seven dollars, and they're plenty worth their money. Especially when nosier classmates think they can get their feet a little too close to me. You're still in school then, huh? Oh, I just started. Though I can't wait to be done with it. Oh, not that I don't like it. I love it. I just can't wait to get out there and really help. Oh, sure, I buy war bonds, do whatever I can to help the boys overseas, but it just doesn't feel like I'm doing enough. I know what you mean. Do you? Oh, sure. I can't enlist because of my poor health. Or, I guess I couldn't before. I might be able to now. I'm still not sure if I buy this whole story. You suddenly doubling in size and strength? It's just not possible. Here, take a look at this. Oh, that's a cute picture. Is that your family? Well, those are my parents, but that skinny kid right there, that's me. Oh, you were so small back then. Back then? This photograph was taken about five months ago. Five months ago? Yep. I... I don't believe it. But it... it looks just like you. Well, not just like you. Do you believe me now? I'm a heck of a lot closer to believing you now. Can I see that again? Hold on. I think we're almost there. Look. That's where the Nazis are working? That old warehouse? It looks abandoned. That's the address on the business card. But there's only one way to find out for certain. Are you sure you want to do this, Evelyn? I'm sure. Meanwhile, the diabolical Heinrich and his cronies cackle in their dilapidated hideout. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm walking down the roads when I run into this kid. I thought I told you not to call me a kid. What is this? Who are you? Don't you recognize me? The Patriot Kid? Heinrich, how do you know this man? I don't. I've never seen him here before. Sure you have. The guy you left in the street? No. It can't be. It's time to get your daily serving of justice, you Nazi cretins. You are a fool. There are three of us and only one of you. Now, who wants to go first? Wilhelm, get him. Yes, Heinrich. Ah, oh, ah, eat, ah, oh, uh, ah. One down. Who's going to be next? Carl, I'll get him. Oh, ah, 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 ah. This new body sure is something. Scott, help! Evelyn, no! That's right, Mr. Anderson. I've got your girl here. Ah, uh ah. -uh. Don't come any closer. Evelyn, I... It's going to be okay, Scott. Uh, but Evelyn... Trust me. I will go now, and you will stand there and do nothing, if you wish to keep her alive. It's not what I'm going to do. It's what she's going to do. And just then, Evelyn lifted her foot. Ah! My foot! I told you I wear these shoes for a reason. Thank goodness you're safe. Nice work. It feels good to do your part, doesn't it? You'll pay for this, USA. Pay? Haven't you heard? America is the land of the free. Ugh. You're right, Evelyn. It feels good to be a patriot. 
Now, we'd better call the authorities. You were right to call us, kid. There's enough evidence in this warehouse to put these boys away for a long time. It looks like you handled it pretty well by yourselves, though. We were just trying to do our part, sir. Well, you certainly did it. It's not over yet, though. Our detectives have been looking through these research papers, and it's pretty evident that this is just one small fraction of the Nazi activity that's going down in our own fair city. How dreadful! It'll be all right, miss. We are trained for it. And you? Me? Yeah, you. Do you have training in this kind of thing? Well, no, not really. I'm only 19. That's plenty old enough to join the force. Join the police? You brought down a small operation on your own. It would have taken a whole team to do this. Well, I did have a little help from Evelyn here. Oh, not really. He did all the hard work. I hardly lifted a finger. Well, you certainly got the job done today. How would you like to join our squad, young man? It's clear you have the training. Really? You would give me a job? Why, of course. With the work you did here today, we could probably promote you to sergeant. What's your name, kid? My name? I guess you could just call me Sergeant USA. <laughs> Tune in next week when Sergeant USA faces the sinister Dr. Fascistro and the crafty Luftwaffers in yet another star-spangled adventure. See you next time, kids, and remember... If you want to be big and strong like Sergeant USA, be sure to sit down to a hearty bowl of frosted Spam Pops every morning. As the Viking Radio Theater Hour continues, travel behind enemy lines with secret agent Mo Berg in Escape to Calais. In occupied France, valiant American spy Mo Berg creeps through the dark forest towards a German base. His mission? Steals sensitive information from the German command about troop movement and weapons capabilities. Using information from French civilians that have been inside the base, Mo finds a hidden hole in the perimeter fence. He waits for the patrol to pass and squeezes through, careful to make no noise. Mo sticks to the shadows as he sneaks through the buildings. When he reaches the officer's quarters, he picks the lock and grabs as many papers as he can. Just as he is about to leave, a soldier enters. I hold it! Stop! Uh-oh. Guess that's my cue to leave. Mo jumps out the window as the soldier takes aim. He throws a grenade behind him and runs. Mo dashes through the camp as the alarms start to blare. In the confusion and smoke from the explosion, he manages to make it to the forest without getting caught. Man, that was a close one. Good thing those Nazis like a light show. Now, let's see what we've got here. Uh, telegrams, blueprints, maps. I wish my German were better. I can barely read any of this. At least command will be happy. Time for a little disappearing act. Mo weaves through the trees, avoiding his German pursuers. At daybreak, he enters the town of Lille, hoping to either get a ride or hide from the Nazi menace behind him. Oh, those Germans sure are persistent. Now then, I should be able to, ah! To Mo's surprise, he is grabbed and thrown into an alley. Qu'est-ce qui se passe? What do you think you are doing? Are you trying to get yourself killed? What are you talking about? There are German soldiers everywhere. They are setting up checkpoints all over the town. Thanks for the warning. I guess. Who are you? I am the woman who is saving your life. You are Moberg, yes? Uh, how did you know? Oh, please. Your hair, your clothes, your walk. You are obviously American. Besides, my sources said you were in this area. Uh, your sources? And after what, what you, you did last sources? night, all of Normandy knows you are here. Gosh, I didn't realize I was this popular. Uh, shut up. You need to get to the coast, yes? No need to yell. I'm meeting my ride in Calais in two days. I've got to be there on time. I need to give command the intel I stole. What was your plan? Uh, if I couldn't find a ride, I figured I'd just walk. 110 kilometers. That's not so far for a guy like me. I used to play baseball. I'm in great shape. Idiot American. I will help you get to Calais. Uh, what? Why would I need help from you? Trust me, Moberg. I can get you past the checkpoints and into Calais without being seen. Without my help, you will not leave France alive. Ah, uh, well, I wouldn't mind having a ride. Follow me. Please, ladies first. Mo is taken through the side streets of Lille. Any civilians they pass nod at the woman or look at the ground. What is with this town? Everyone looks so... Depressed. Lille has been occupied for two years. The Germans bombed part of the town when the town tried to fight back. People have become very good at staying quiet and following orders. 
The mysterious woman leads Mo to a tavern with a horse-drawn cart out front. The woman slips the driver some money and lifts the canvas covering the barrels of alcohol. Is that what I think it is? Oui, Marie Antoinette barrel brand aged whiskey. The whiskey is so smooth it's crazy. In the States, you can only find it at Select Riverdales, the purveyors of fine whiskey. Boy, I'd love to get me a glass right now. <laughs> yes, that sounds refreshing, but for now we must hide in here. Oui? Oui, I am not letting you out of my sight until you are out of my country. You have caused enough trouble already. Now get in. Fine. But why do we need to hide in this cart? The odor of the whiskey will cover your scent if the Germans have dogs. Two of these barrels are empty, we will hide in them. Wait, my scent? Uh, don't you mean our scent? Of course, you call it a slip of the tongue, no? <laughs> Safely hidden in the barrels, the cart takes the two through the German checkpoint at the edge of town. After a few cramped hours, Mo and the woman leave their hiding spots to sit on the back of the cart. The driver said he would take us as far as Dunkirk. We can find another ride in the morning. Great. I'll have to smell like whiskey the rest of the way, then. Would you like to smell like whiskey or be dead? Are those my only two options? Uh, I know a safe place to spend the night in Dunkirk. Good. Maybe I can take a shower there. It is an old barn. There is no water. Great. It will be safe. That is what matters. I guess. Uh, hey, you never told me your name. You do not need it. Uh, you know mine. It's only fair that I know yours. <sighs> my name is Violette. Uh... Violet? Pretty name. Violet. Violet. Whatever. <laughs> they spend the rest of the ride in silence and reach their destination as night falls. The barn, as promised, is abandoned. The inside is littered with broken furniture and rusting farm equipment. Are you sure this place is safe? Of course it is. The Germans do not know about it. At least they shouldn't. <laughs> I'm not talking about Germans. I don't want to die because a barn collapses on me while I'm sleeping. It will not collapse. This is not the first time I have slept here. Are there beds, then? There is hay. Great! I'll be itchy and smell like whiskey in the morning. Viola and Mo settle in for the night. They share what little food they have cold because they cannot light a fire for fear of being seen. After their frugal meal, Violette takes out a needle and thread and repairs a small tear in her dress. Mo checks on his stolen papers, then, bored, explores every inch of the barn until he's tripping over his feet in the darkness. He flops down next to Violette, who has finished her sewing and is staring at the ceiling. So, are you from around here? I was born in Paris. I studied there for a bit. Did you like it? It was... nice. Well, you're great for conversation. You want to talk, talk. I will not stop you. Fine, I will. I've traveled a lot, you know, for baseball. All over the world. The Philippines, Greece, France. Even went to Japan a couple of times. Wouldn't really want to go there now, after Pearl Harbor. That's why I joined up, you know. I wanted to do my part. I know some French, so they wanted to put me behind enemy lines. Figured I'd be the most use here than in the army. Fascinating. What about you? What about me? How did a gal like you end up sneaking around occupied France? Are you with the resistance or something? I do not wish to talk about it. That makes it sound like you are. You know nothing about me. Well, enlighten me. No. Everybody's got a reason. I told you mine. No. Come on. Pretty young thing like yourself shouldn't be in the middle of a war. You've got to have a reason. Uh, fine, Monsieur Berg. I will tell you. Before the war, I was married. My husband was in the military, and he was killed in action. I was angry. I wanted revenge, so I joined the SOE in London. I speak French, so they put me here. I am trying to organize the resistance, and you are doing excellent, delaying my plans by blowing up German bases and drawing attention to yourself. Is that a good enough reason? Uh, I'm sorry, Violet. I didn't know. Go to sleep. We need to be rested for tomorrow. The two spies lay in silence for a while, staring at the ceiling. Uh, I want revenge, too. What? I didn't just join the war because of Pearl Harbor. I'm Jewish. I've read the papers. I know what Hitler's been saying about them, and the laws they passed. I can't just sit in one place and do nothing. I want to help. I can't let any more innocent people get hurt. I did not know. It's not something you really try to advertise in occupied territory. I thought you just cared about your job. And I thought you were just a pretty face. We are quite the pair, no? Yeah, I just hope that my intel is worth messing with your plans. We will have to see, but we really should get some sleep. Good night, Violet. Bonne nuit, Mo. 
Violet quickly falls asleep. Mo stays awake longer, trying to find a comfortable position in the prickly hay. He finds himself looking at Violet's face, lit by the weak beams of moonlight coming through the cracks in the roof. Oh, this mission better be damn worth the effort. Mo falls asleep soon after, and they rest until the first light of dawn. Viola is the first to wake up, and she immediately notices something wrong. Mo, Mo, wake up! I think Zaban is on fire! Huh? What? Is that smoke? Zaban is on fire! How? Viola and Mo rush to a window and peer outside as smoke fills the room. The barn is surrounded by German soldiers. Come out, Moberg! We know you're in there! How did they find us? I do not know! I bet it was that cart driver. Did you pay him enough? That does not matter now. How are we going to escape? You die in there or you die out here. Your choice. Oh, I've always been terrible at making decisions. Mo throws a grenade out of the window. Achtung, Renate! Mo grabs Violette by the arm and they run from the burning barn. The soldiers not injured in the explosion begin to shoot at the spies. Violette picks up her pistol and returns fire. <laughs> They reach one of the German cars and Mo gets behind the wheel. Violet gets in the passenger seat and they drive away. Slot seat! <laughs> Three German cars drive after the spies. Drive steady, I will take care of them. Are you sure you can handle that? Violet fe- lets off four shots. And two of the cars swerve off the road, their front tires blown out. Whoa, where did you learn to shoot? From my father, now drive! Violette takes aim at the last car, but a sudden swerve from Mo makes her shots go wide. Mo, I am out of ammunition. Give me your pistol. I've got a better idea. Mo throws a grenade behind them, and it rolls underneath the last German car. Where did you learn to throw? Baseball, remember? <laughs> they drive the stolen car until it runs out of gas. After stripping it of useful supplies and pushing it off the road, they set out to walk the last stretch of road to Calais. Don't you think we should destroy the car? Why? Well, they could have dogs, like you said. I'm sure they could get our scent off the seats. What do you suggest? Mo holds up his last grenade, and Violette grins. Mo does an exaggerated wind-up and throws the grenade at the car with perfect aim. Violette and Mo cut through the countryside to avoid any German soldiers on the main road. Eventually, they approach the beach where Mo is to meet his ride as the sun begins to set. Oh, finally we're here. I don't think I can walk another step. I thought it was no problem to walk. You are supposed to be a great baseball player, are you not? Well, I may not have told you the whole truth. I'm just a catcher. I don't run that much. (laughs) It is a good thing I found you. You would have passed out halfway to Dunkirk. Uh, Probably closer to three quarters. Their banter is interrupted by a small boat approaching the shore. Well, there's my ride. Hey, Mo. Enjoy your vacation? The boat comes to halt in the shallows, revealing a grinning Private Adamson at the helm. It was wonderful. You should have come. Sorry, I had other plans. Who's the dame? Easy, Adamson. Just take these below deck. I need to talk to my friend. <laughs> All right, uh, you two have a nice talk. Private Adamson goes into the cabin with a wink. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. He's a nice kid, but uh, he's got a mouth on him. Reminds me of someone I know. Ha ha. So this is goodbye? Well, it doesn't have to be. You could come with me. There's room for one more. I need to stay here. War's no place for someone like you. Maybe, but my work is not done. I cannot leave now. Uh, I thought you'd say something like that. Uh, Here, there's something I want you to have. Mo reaches into his bag and pulls out a worn baseball. This is from my first season in the Major Leagues. Did you win it? Nope. Gave me a black (laughs) eye because I wasn't paying attention. (laughs) Uh, We did get the pennant that season, but I kept this ball to remind me of all the hard work it took to get there. Here, take it. No, I cannot. Uh, Please, you need it more than I do. Whenever the going gets tough, just look at it and think about how all that hard work is going to pay off in the end. Mo takes Violet's hands and wraps them around the baseball. Thank you. Hey, Mo, we gotta get moving. All right, all right, I'm coming. Good luck, Violet. Bon chance to you as well, Mo. Goodbye. Au revoir. Mo gets onto the boat and Private Adamson steers them away from the beach. Mo waves from the boat at Violet's shrinking form. She waves back, holding up the baseball for Mo to see. Au revoir, Violet. Until we meet again. 
The end. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Good evening. Now for a quick update on the affairs of the war and other news, both abroad and at home. As many of you know, just a little over a month ago, the Soviet government announced the final defeat of the German Sixth Army at the port of Stalingrad in Russia. After five months of heavy fighting for control of the city, over 90,000 German soldiers have been taken into custody as prisoners of war. This defeat has marked a turning point in the German campaign for Northern Europe. Due to shortages on copper, the United States Treasury Department struck its first batch of steel pennies on February 23rd of this year. However, much controversy is being made of various flaws with these replacements, particularly their tendency to rust with the slightest exposure to moisture, whether rain or human sweat. The Treasury has yet to issue a statement on how these concerns will be addressed. In local news, a break in the Peterson's Pharmacy was reported earlier this morning. One large shipment of thallium was stolen in a suspected mob raid. Persons with information relating to this crime should report to the Captain Cordana at the 16th Precinct. Taking place in the next few hours, the 15th Academy Awards in Los Angeles will recognize the prestigious films of 1942. With no less than 12 award nominations, Mrs. Miniver is expected to win Outstanding Motion Picture this year. A portrait of tonight's ceremony will be broadcast by our CBS radio affiliates, which you can tune into later this evening at 8.30 Pacific. In the European theater, we've just received a report that three days ago, the United States and Royal Air Forces successfully completed a joint bombing raid in the German capital itself. Early reports we're receiving from the war office suggest hundreds of casualties. Nazi morale is reported to be at an all-time low following the raid. This radio station will continue to bring you updates as more parts come in. We now return to the Viking Radio Theater Hour. This week on Out of This World Adventures, we once again join our dashing hero, Nick Nelson, an agent of the Terran Confederation. The Confederation is humanity's interstellar civilization and is at war with the Terror, an evil alliance of the most thuggish and violent races in the universe who seek to enslave and subjugate the cosmos. Nick Nelson arrives on the distant planet of Safrion, where the reclusive human scientist Dr. Jane Richardson lives out among the alien Safronians. Upon arrival, our hero goes to the doctor's secluded mansion. Dr. Richardson? Yes. Who the Chromalium are you? I'm Nick Nelson. You may have heard of me. I'm the Terran agent who thwarted the Mesopotamic conspiracy and defeated the carnivorous Inyex. No, I'm afraid I haven't heard of you. I generally try to avoid men with guns. I'm sorry you disapprove of my weapon, ma'am, but a ray gun is a necessary precaution in these times of war. Perhaps in some parts of the galaxy, but Safrion is a neutral planet. Yes, ma'am, but I still have to carry it. May I come in? I have an important matter to discuss with you. Very well. May I offer you some cookies? I wouldn't want to be a bad hostess. My granddaughter has some baking in the oven. Cookies? I haven't had a cookie since I left home ten years ago. Well, I'm sure you'll love these. They're my special recipe. Don't tell anyone, but the secret ingredient is fluoridated bacteriophage. It adds a little fizzle to the cookies. Oh. Uh, that sounds delightful, but I'm not here for cookies. I'm here to talk to you about your latest invention. It could prove invaluable in our war against the Terror. Of course. You want to see... the robot. Yes, ma'am, I do. Then come right this way and I'll take you to the exhibition room. This is where I display and store all my inventions. Here's my patented laser wrench and my magnetic torque reducer. And what's that? That's a toaster. Oh. But this, this is my masterpiece. It's nothing like our scientists predicted. It's amazing. What do you call it, Doctor? It's Aurora Kalyan Energy Powered LM5368 AI Resuscitator and Medical Aid Robot. But I like to call him Rory the Robot. What exactly does it do, Doctor? It's an emergency medic, designed to fulfill all possible medical needs in a variety of hazardous situations and environments. Who wants some cookies? Hello, my dear child. Mr. Nelson, this is my lovely young granddaughter, Susan. Wonderful to meet you, miss. Oh, the pleasure's all mine. Cookie, they've got a nice fizzy kick to them. Um, no thanks. 
I uh, just had breakfast. Susan, I was just telling Nick here about the Roy the Robot. Oh, wonderful. So exciting. Robots. Uh, it was a lot of work making Rory, but it was a labor of love. And it was made so much easier with the handy dandy mix need riveter 9000. I have never riveted so many mechanical fasteners so fast in my life. Using the latest technology, even an old woman like me can be like Rosie the Riveter, available at any local Johnson Johnson and McSneed outlet. Wow. I'll pick one up as soon as I can, before supplies run out. You'd better... You'd better hurry, then. What? Who are you? Oh, that's Geronia. She's a local Saffronian we hired to help out around the mansion, and to teach us about the planet's culture. There is so much that we humans can learn from the Saffronians. Yes, I've heard a lot about how advanced the Saffronian medical practices are. I've also heard a lot about the Saffronians' aversion to fighting. My people feel that peace is more important than getting involved in the middle of outsiders' squabbles. Well, sometimes you have to fight to protect the peace. But back to the matter at hand. Doctor, what inspired you to create this incredible machine? I've been inventing since I was a child. It's my greatest passion. But the men of the scientific community back on Earth never accepted me. So I decided to create a robot in order to pr prove my abilities as a scientist. I'm curious, though. Why build a medical robot? I wanted to bring some light into this dark, violent world we live in. The scientists on Earth thought that I was mad to think a medical robot was possible. Well, if your robot works as you claim, it could be invaluable to the Confederation's soldiers. What else can the robot do? Can it talk? Yes, it can. What kind of a robot doesn't talk? Rory, activate. Good evening, Dr. Richardson. It's morning, Rory. You did not give me a chronometer. I have no sense of time. <laughs> of course not. We wouldn't want you to become too powerful. <laughs> no, I suppose not. So, if you don't want it to be too powerful, I assume you don't want it to have artificial intelligence or emotions. No, no, it needs intelligence in order to make quick medical judgments. And I believe that emotions are also essential so it can empathize with its patients. Is that even possible? It's a very delicate matter. It still requires further experimentation. Oh, is that a thunderstorm out there? It sounds strange. On Saffron, storms are very rare, but when they happen, the atmosphere is filled with electrostatic electro radio radiation. Radiation. No, I haven't installed the electroradioactive dampers yet. Why does that matter? Without the dampers to ground Rory's circuits, the electrostatic atmosphere of the storm will drive the robot insane. <sighs> the power's gone out. Susan! <laughs> the power's back on, but the robot's gone. So is my granddaughter. Lovely. Where could they be? I don't know. Maybe he went down the path of destruction. You know, the trail of knockdown equipment and the smash down door. Just a guess. <laughs> that leads to the laboratory. Then there's no time to lose. To the laboratory. Are you sure? It seems awfully risky just going directly after the robot like this. We have to. Susan's life could be at stake. But if you're afraid, you don't have to come. <laughs> I'm not afraid. Good. Dr. Richardson, where's the laboratory? Just two doors down the hall. Susan! What is that? It's a giant glass tank, and why is Susan inside? Why doesn't she respond? It's as if she's frozen. I hate to state the obvious, but the robot isn't here. The depraved beast! How could he? I don't understand, Dr. Richardson. What has the robot done to Susan? Rory must have found my notes on time. I had the schematics ready for a time machine, but with his high level of intelligence, Rory has been able to slow down the time particles. My research was never meant to be used like this. What did he do? This device is a small-scale temporal stasis generator. Everything within that tank is frozen in time, including Susan. Wait, you said small-scale. Does that mean that there's also a large-scale version? 
I never built one, but if Rory is able to figure out how to turn a small scale generator into a large scale generator. What, Doctor? What could he do with a large scale device? It would essentially be a kind of time bomb. If detonated, it would cause the time particles to reach absolute zero, creating a stasis field that would expand to encompass the entire planet. All of Saffrion? Frozen in time? Yes. We have to stop him. You're right, but how do we find him? Rory has a tracking device built into him. Here's the tracking monitor. It appears that he's just outside the mansion. Good, then let's go. But first, we have to get Susan out. How? This glass looks impervious. Just press that large red button. Oh. Susan! Grandmother? Come here, my sweet child. Are you all right? I... I think so. This is nice, but time is literally of the essence. You're right, Sharonia. Come on, everyone. He's around here somewhere. He can't be far. I see him. He's got some sort of machine with him. Rory, stop. I must save us all. Stop this madness. I am not mad. Not mad? You kidnapped this girl and froze her in time. Why, Rory? Why would you do that, Susan? It was necessary. I required a test subject before proceeding to the next stage. So you do intend to detonate a time bomb? Correct. But Rory, you're meant to be a healer, not a killer. You do not understand. I am healing. Biological life forms are born dying. I will prevent death by stopping time on this planet. No, I will not allow everything I hold dear to be destroyed by some tin can robot. Sharonia, don't! Ah! Pathetic organic being. Oof. Sharonia! Get your hands off me, you beast! Rory's going to kill her! I'll stop him with my ray gun. <laughs> it has no effect on him. Aim for the control ray on the back of his head. What? It's his one weak spot. <laughs> Is he dead? Yes. His function circuits have com been completely destroyed. The robot is dead. Oh, my head. Nick, you saved my life. I don't know how I could ever repay you. Don't worry about it. I'm just doing my job. My masterpiece is gone. It was a failure. Don't say that, Grandmother. Yes. Even if this robot was flawed, that doesn't mean you can't build a better one. And this time you can do it with the support of the Terran Confederation. Do you really think so? Yes. With so many of our men at the front, the Confederation could use women like you as part of the war effort. I would like to see my inventions put to good use. Good. Then I'll arrange for your transport back to the Confederation. Now wait a second, young man. I haven't agreed to go with you yet. But Grandmother, I can hardly remember Earth. It's been so long since we were there. Wouldn't it be marvelous to see it again? Perhaps, my dear. And I would like to be able to help our people's cause, but it's a very large decision. Will you at least consider it, Dr. Richardson? I'll think about it. And you, Sharonia? Our home planet has technology and comforts you wouldn't believe. Flying cars, pocket phones, floating cities. A brave young woman like you could do well in the Confederation. Thank you, but I'm afraid I have to say no. Still skeptical about our war? No, I think I understand now what you mean about needing to fight for peace. But I must remain with my own people. If that's what you want. It is. You're right. Some things are worth fighting and sacrificing for. Earth isn't perfect, but it's worth protecting. Then you'll come back and help our war effort? Yes, we will. Wonderful! The two of you will be greatly missed. We'll miss you too, and we'll miss Saffrion. Indeed. But we have to help our own kind. They need us. Especially now, in the midst of war. Come on, Grandmother, let's go start packing! I hope that the two of you will still stay in touch with me. I'll write to you every day, Sharonia, but I doubt we'll have anything terribly exciting to tell you. <laughs> I suspect that your adventures are far from over. I have a feeling you're right, Sharonia. And so concludes this week's exciting episode of Out of This World Adventures, brought to you by Johnson, Johnson, and McSneed. Join us next week as Nick Nelson defends Earth from The Martian Peril.
Good evening. We would like to take a moment to give a brief update on the affairs of the war, both abroad and at home. Just yesterday, Thursday, February 18th, a Boeing bomber plane crashed into Seattle's frying packing plant. The details of the bomber type are still unknown to the public. Just 20 minutes after takeoff from the Boeing field, a woman in the Smith Tower noticed it flying low over the downtown area with a smoking engine. The plane crash was successful in slowing the blaze, giving the pilot, identified as Eddie Allen, enough time to turn back towards Boeing. And were only a few moments after, the engine burst into flames, catching on one of the wings. According to eyewitnesses, the plane began to fly extremely low and crooked, heading towards the ground. Two crewmen attempted to parachute from the burning plane, but their chutes did not open in time. After narrowly missing the downtown skyscrapers, the plane crashed into the Fry Building plant. In the massive explosion, all members of the crew and 20 of the plant workers were killed. A firefighter was also killed on the scene. Fortunately, most workers in the packing plant were on their lunch break when this incident occurred and were not harmed. At the controls of this top secret plane was Boeing's test pilot, Eddie Allen, who has been commended by his peers for his skill and excellence in piloting. He is a great loss to Boeing and the war effort. We now return to the Viking Radio Theater Hour. Here to save the day, it's Sergeant USA. <laughs> Kids, grab a refreshing can of Rizzy Bing Zesty Ham Soda and sit yourselves down for the thrilling adventures of Sergeant USA and his spectacular battles with our nation's greatest enemies. Ever since that transformative peck from a radioactive bald eagle, the once mild mannered Ulysses Scott Anderson has used his superhuman strength to protect our beloved Stars and Stripes as the heroic patriot we know as Sergeant USA. <laughs> In tonight's episode, brought to you by Rizzy Bing Brand Ham Soda, our hero must once again face the treacherous Dr. Fascistro. We find our young hero returning back to the military base, exhausted from another battle. Boy, it's any wonder I got myself out of that scrap. Good work, Sergeant. That was almost as close as our bout with Blitzkrieg and his Axis Ataxis trio. <laughs> Thank you, General Spangle. Yes, Blitzkrieg, that squirrely fellow. Little did that shapeshifter know that no disguise can hide from justice. Well, let's see him try to shapeshift his way out of prison. Uh, well, let's hope security's tight. <laughs> I'm glad you're here, Sergeant. I know you just got off another job, but I'm afraid something's important's come up while you were out. Oh? What is it this time? Is it Hitler? <laughs> I'm afraid not, Sergeant. This time it's Dr. Fascistro. My arch nemesis. It would seem that his cronies, the Luftwaffers, have, well, they've taken Evelyn, Sergeant. No, not Evelyn. Evelyn, my nurse friend and periodic sidekick that healed me and brought me to defeat Heinrich von Heinrichstein and bring my valiant career as Sergeant USA to light? No, not Evelyn, whom my feelings for are ambiguous and possibly romantic, but most likely just friendly. No, not her. I'm afraid so, Sergeant. The Luftwaffers allegedly flew into her apartment in the middle of the day and took her away. With those high-tech jetpacks. Yes. They left a message behind, here. Let me take a look here. USA, we've taken your lady friend. If you want her back, you had better make your way to Bismarck, quickly. You will recognize our base when you see it. And you better come along. Lieben, Dr. Fascistro. That scoundrel. She's all the way in Bismarck. That's right. Bismarck, North Dakota. <laughs> oh, uh, are you sure it's not Germany? Nah. Uh, they left a return address on the envelope. See? Oh. Well, I suppose it makes sense. No one ever knows what goes on in North Dakota. <laughs> what do you propose we do? There's only one thing to do. I'm going to Bismarck. Would you like some men to go with you? At least to send them in once you've got Evelyn. No, General. We can't have American soldiers fighting my battles. We need them out there defending our country. Are you sure, Sergeant? Yes. And besides, if Dr. Fascistro wants me to come alone, I'm not risking anything else. Not with Evelyn there. He's my arch nemesis. This is my battle. But it's clearly some kind of trap. General, don't you think I can handle whatever it is they have prepared? I'm sure you can, Sergeant. You're the best there is. I only hope Evelyn is all right. Our hero quickly gets in his fighter plane, Little Patriot, and heads straight for the lavish land of Bismarck, North Dakota. Ah, beautiful Bismarck. I wonder where that base is. 
As she said, I'd be able to recognize it pretty easy. Ah! That must be it. As USA flies over the city, he spots an enormous industrial-sized waffle house near the city outskirts called the Luftwaffle Hut. <laughs> Not very subtle, those Nazis. <laughs> Suppose I'll just land in the parking lot here. Our hero lands Little Patriot and looks at the enormous building in front of him. A giant menacing waffle logo frowns down at him. He heroically walks in. Inside is a tiny diner. This can't be the whole building. Something strange is afoot. Oh, hello. What may we help you with today? Just a cup of Joe will do fine, miss. I'm waiting for someone. Okay, here you are. That was awfully fast. Oh, we always have our jaw cups ready. Say, your restaurant seems kind of peopleless. Slow day? It is an average business day. Will you be drinking your joe now? Drink it when I'm ready. Seems a bit hot. Drink! <laughs> the waitress smacks the coffee into our hero's face. Uh, uh. Suddenly getting sleepy. What did you put in this Joe? Never you mind, Mr. USA. <laughs> you, you dastardly woman. Uh, Evelyn, Joe. <laughs> Our hero wakes up in a large and dark room tied to a chair. A single light hangs over him. Yeah, untie me, Fashistra, wherever you are. Where is Evelyn? Do not worry about that yet, USA! <laughs> Dr. Fascistro waltzes out of the dark. His evil goggles shine in the lamplight. What's the meaning of all this, Fascistro? If you are so curious, USA, I will tell you the meaning of all this. You see, USA, my beloved Luftwaffers are very loyal men. Very nimble, spry little men. They do most everything I tell them, but alas, they are not strong men. They're not strong enough for what I need, at least. Get to the point, Fashistro. I am getting there. Do not rush. I needed my men to become super soldiers, USA, and I thought to myself, who is the most super person that I know? Why, you, of course, USA. I'm flattered, but what does this have to do with Evelyn? Well, I needed to lure you here somehow. From our past encounters, I knew she would be your best weakness. Would you like to see her? Of course you would. Wilhelm, turn on the lights. Yes, Dr. Fascistro. <laughs> the lights turn on, and USA sees the huge factory around him. On a conveyor belt sit many patient Nazi soldiers. The conveyor belt leads to a large, sinister machine. In a room at the other end of the factory, our hero spots Evelyn through a window. She is tied to a chair, calm and composed, surrounded by guards. Let her go, you Nazi cretin. Oh, my boy, of course I will let her go. But first, I need something from you. A lesson from my fists? Oh, <laughs> no, Mr. USA. You are very cute. No, I need your blood. Your supercharged blood from where all your super strength is drawn. I want it for my Luftwaffers. You can't have it. Oh, well, that is too bad. Because if I cannot have it, we might just have to get rid of you, dear Evelyn. Won't we? One of the guards surrounding Evelyn cracks his knuckles. What do you plan to do to me? Oh, I only need to prick you with this needle here, so I may draw some blood from my machine. Afterwards, who knows? Our hero attempts to break free once more, but it is no good. Uh, well, I suppose there's nothing I can do. Excellent! Now let me just draw a sample here. So there we are. Hmm, you have very light purplish blood, USA. Very interesting. Now to try this on a test subject. Wilhelm, get in here. Yes, Dr. Fascistro. Oh! <laughs> we are going to find out how USA's blood works, Wilhelm. If my science is correct, soon your body shall adopt all the super strength that has adorned our friend here. Oh, I am honored, sir. Soon I will cease to be a mere noodle of a man. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ideally. <laughs> I am beginning to feel something. Sort of a burning sensation all over. Yes, your muscles, you are getting stronger. Oh. What is this? Your nose, it is getting rather aquiline. I think, I think I am balding. What's going on here? Fascism is starting to feel wrong. 
No, it can't be. The purple blood must have been a mixture of... Red, white, and blue. <laughs> oh, what is happening? Oh, oh. <laughs> I feel free. Impossible. <laughs> now with the blood of American patriotism flowing through his veins, his Nazism vanquished, Wilhelm picks up Fascistro and throws him across the room. Watch out, Evelyn. Oof. Wilhelm has thrown Fascisto through the window and knocked out the guard surrounding Evelyn. He begins to untie our hero. Well, Wilhelm, I guess you're one with the team now, eh? It is miraculous. Suddenly everything seems clear. I see the evils of fascism now. <laughs> Good to have you on the side of justice, friend. As Wilhelm finishes untying USA, a swarm of Nazis head their way from the conveyor belt. Uh-oh. Do not worry about them, sergeants. Go help Evelyn. I will hold them off. Our hero rushes into the room with Evelyn and the passed out Nazis. Well, it's nice to see you, Scott. Are you all right, Evelyn? Here, I'll untie you. Oh, yes, I'm all right. These Luftwaffe guys have been trying to get all kinds of information out of me, but I've just been telling them that I couldn't understand German. It really got their jumpsuits in a knot. <laughs> Good old Evelyn. USA unties Evelyn, and they see Wilhelm fighting the Luftwaffers. What happened over there? We have a new fighter on our team. Well, let's not just stand here, then. USA and Evelyn join Wilhelm in the battle against the Luftwaffe horde. The Nazis rush after USA, their biggest target, as soon as he enters the fight. Surrounded, our brave hero fights off as many as he can, punching and kicking with all of his might. But there are dozens and dozens of them. He becomes overwhelmed. Take that. And that. And that! Oh, oh, there's too many of them! Wilhelm, Evelyn, too much fascism! <laughs> Our hero is surrounded on all sides. How will he get out of this one? Take this! Suddenly, Wilhelm vaults Evelyn over the crowd, and the heels of her new goody two brand shoes, sparkling with a fresh coat of Uncle Borowitz's Polish shoe polish, bring a pile of Nazis crashing to the floor. <laughs> Don't forget about me, fellas! Wilhelm continues to fight from the outside in. The fight rages on as our patriotic team wears down the Luftwaffers. Uh, here. Oh, 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 oh. Finally, the last Nazi falls to the floor defeated as the USA, Evelyn, and Wilhelm stand over him victorious. Well, another win for Team USA. What, what should we do now? Well, we could give all these soldiers a little shot to make them patriots, like our friend here. Sounds good to me. You haven't seen the last of me, USA! <laughs> Fascistro! Riding on the back of one of the flying Luftwaffers, Dr. Fascistro soars through a high factory window. <laughs> Darn, we forgot about Fascistro. Should we follow him? No, I have a feeling that we haven't seen the last of him. For now, let's just denazify these soldiers, find our way out of here, and go back to the military base. Right. Could I come back with you? I want to fight by your side with the Allies. Of course, Wilhelm. You're with us now. Are you sure it's safe, Scott? He was a Nazi. <laughs> I was, but now I could not be more certain of my dedication to America. I believe you, son, but I don't know if the world will with a name like Wilhelm. You're right, the name Wilhelm just screams Germany. How about William, or better yet, Billy? Billy? I like it. It has a freedom -y ring to it. <laughs> well then, let freedom ring! <laughs> <laughs> Tune in next week when Sergeant USA fights the bizarro Churchill in yet another Star Spangled Adventure. See you next time, kids, and remember... Nothing fuels you better than a hot can of Rizzy Bing Zesty Ham Soda. <laughs> We hope you enjoyed our 1940s-themed episode. Our next episode will be back in the present day and the future with the third chapter of our multi-part serial, Lost Souls. Remember, if you're interested in being part of our show, email us at vikingradiotheater at gmail.com. Our chief sound engineer is Blair Lorenzo, and Viking Radio Theater's theme music is written and composed by Cat Miller. From the cast and crew of Viking Radio Theater, thanks for listening.